Welcome to the National Center on Self-Employment, Business Ownership, and Telecommuting webcast series. Today's webcast will focus on self-employment and benefits. This webcast is in partnership with Virginia Commonwealth University Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. My name is Julie McComas, and I am a senior associate with Griffin Hammes Associates. Joining me today are Dustin Clark and Suzanne Paulson. Dustin is a graphic designer from Columbus, Ohio, working as a contractor for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. He is both self-employed and a telecommuter. Dustin has a degree in digital design and graphics from Columbus State Community College and a degree in visual communication design from The Ohio State University. We had the privilege of hearing Dustin's employment story during the July 26th webcast, which was focused on telecommuting. Suzanne is the Benefits Planning Resource Manager for the Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. She has her master's degree from Drake University in Rehabilitation and Mental Health Counseling and is a Certified Rehabilitation Counselor and a Certified Community Work Incentives Benefits Counselor through VCU and SSA. You can read more about Dustin and Susie on our website at centeronselfemployment.org. So today we're going to be talking about self-employment and benefits. And particularly, we're going to be talking about social security benefits and some of the work incentives that are available for people who are self-employed and who are also receiving SSI and SSDI. Suzanne is a specialist in this topic and is going to be sharing a lot of information with us in our time together, some definitions to make sure that we really all understand what we're talking about um, when, when we're talking about the various types of benefits that are available and what we're talking about when we're talking about work incentives. Dustin is going to be sharing some of his pers personal experiences with making decisions around benefits and um, when to utilize work incentives and when to move forward with um, foregoing a cash benefit, his cash and social security benefit. And so Susie, I welcome you to um, give us a little bit of background information about SSI and SSDI, just so we know um, kind of what it is that, um, when we're always saying this person gets SSI or this person gets SSDI, what does that mean? What are people getting when, when they're getting those benefits? Yeah, so the actual definition that Social Security uses is the same for SSDI as it is for SSI. And basically, it's that inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity due to a medical or a mental impairment that's expected to last at least 12 months or result in death. Now, when you break that down, you're talking about um, it's it's a mental or a medical impairment, which we know that, but when it talks about the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity, that's what they refer to as SGA. This year, that's 1,350. So for an individual to qualify for SSDI, they would have need to have worked and to have paid in through their payroll taxes. Um, it's money that you literally, you set it aside for yourself for when you become re retired. But if you become disabled prior to your full retirement, then you actually are able to draw off of your work history as if you're already at your full retirement. It's a really cool insurance. But there are a lot of individuals who are born with a disability or they acquire it pretty early in life. So they don't have that work history uh, to draw off of or anybody else's work history. And so what Social Security does is they provide enough money for the individual's shelter and food. That's uh, set each year. It's called the federal benefit rate. And that's the amount of SSI or supplemental security income. So like I said, the the SGA level or substantial gainful activity for 2022 is $1,350 in gross earned income in a month. The SGA is a little higher for individuals that are considered statutory blind. This year, that amount is $2,260 earned in a month. And so when we're looking at that SGA level and self-employment, it's going to play out differently for individuals that are on SSI or SSDI. 
Um, Social Security, when you're wage employed, they're going to look at um, how much you have in gross earned wages each month. But when you're self-employed, they don't look at the gross profit or your gross sales. What they're looking at is that net earnings from self-employment or what we call NESI sometimes. And so how they determine that is they're going to take your your sales or your what you make in uh, net you know, your gross profits, and they're going to subtract your expenses. And that bottom line is going to be your net profit. And then Social Security is actually going to allow you to apply, um, you know, because when you're self-employed, it's you have to pay both sides of the uh, the employer Social Security tax as well as your portion of it. But when you're wage employed, you only have the you have an employer that's paying it. So IRS isn't going to allow that as a deduction, but Social Security does. So what they what that does is it reduces the amount of countable income you have, and if you go to the next slide, it talks about what that calculation looks like. On um, actually, yeah, okay. So to arrive at that net earnings from self-employment or NESI, they're going to look at the person's net profit. So they've got their sales, they've got their expenses, and then you've got your net profit. So that's the amount that the person is going to get taxed on, right? Um, but then Social Security is going to look at that and they're going to give them back some of that money. They multiply by 0.9235 and that determines their net earnings from self-employment. So if you look at the, uh, the example that I use, this person has sales of $12,000 for the year. Uh, they have $7,000 in expenses, and so their net profit, what they're going to pay taxes on, is $5,000. But then Social Security is going to lower it down to $4,618, and then they're going to divide it by 12, and that's going to determine their monthly net earnings from self-employment. And Susie, can you talk for just a moment about what's the importance of this? I mean, it... it the way you know the way that Social Security looks at this, what what in what way does that benefit the self-employed individual? I, I think that it makes it. Um, I I think self-employment is a really good option for a lot of people with disabilities because to a certain extent, if you have a disability, you're you know one day you may be able to work at full power, but the next day you may not be able to. So there's a lot of flexibility as far as that goes, but there's. So, you know, because you're in charge, you're you're the business owner, but um, also when they're just looking at gross wages, um, I think it's a less of a hit if you're self-employed um, for individuals and it's spread out for the whole year. Did, does that answer what you were asking? Okay. So thanks again, Susie, for explaining all of that to us and giving us a background on um, understanding how Social Security looks at self-employment earnings. Can you tell us a little bit about what, just in general, what are work incentives? What are Social Security work incentives? What are they for? What does that mean? What are we talking about when we're talking about work incentives? The work incentives provide specific uh, safety nets for individuals as they're trying work, as they're increasing the amount that they're working. And so an individual just doesn't go to work one day and they lose their benefits. There's also several work incentives that provide really easy, simple ways for the individual to get right back on benefits. And that's super important to people because otherwise I think people will limit themselves or they they won't even try to go to work because oftentimes they've spent years trying to get on benefits and gotten denied and denied and then finally they're on it and to put that at risk at all it 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 takes it's a long conversation it takes people a while to figure out that you really are going to be better off by going back to work and so these safety nets kind of provide different um work you know they just provide that ability for the individual to try work and then to expand what their work is Susie, thank you so much for that explanation about work, what a work incentive is. And now we, um, what I want to show you right now on the screen is just a um, kind of a long list of those various work incentives that Social Security has set up. And we're not going to go into all of these. And in fact, here in just a moment, Susie's going to highlight some of those work incentives that are um, you know, really applicable and very important to know about. 
Um, and we will at the end of the presentation share with you some resources and make sure that you have access to um, more information from Social Security about all the work incentives that are available. But we wanted to show you this slide to just kind of give you an idea of the myriad of, of options that are available to folks. And many people can use multiple work incentives together or you know, over a you know, certain work incentives over a period of time. But there are a number of work incentives built in to do just as Susie said, to encourage people to, um, to realize their own potential as workers and begin to step into that world of work. And a lot of times finding that self-employment is a very good, a very good option for people. Um, to, to, you know, build wealth, to use their skills, um, and, you know, to kind of make their way into the community. And so a lot of these work incentives are there to help that happen um, with those safety nets in place. So Susie, let's start talking about some of these work incentives. Um, tell us a little bit about one of these work incentives that's, that's very important, and it's called Property Essential to Self-Support. Uh, yes, so this is a work incentive that's specifically for individuals that receive supplemental security income. So remember I said that that benefit is, is essentially a welfare uh, program. Everything affects it, earned income, unearned income, and there's resource limits related to SSI. Um, the resource limits are $2,000 in um, countable resources, like they exclude a house that you own or the car that you need to go to work. Um, and they and uh, it's it's a one shot deal. So they look at it like you can go over two thousand dollars in the month, but at that end of the month, going into the new month, all of your resources have to be below two thousand, or you're going to be over resourced and lose that benefit for the whole month. Um, so it's really important for people to understand property essential to self-support. Basically, what that does is it allows the individual to collect resources and um, money in their business and it won't make them lose their benefit. Um, a good example would be somebody who's a mechanic and they have you know $15,000 worth of tools. Well, that would put them over resources because they could sell that and have over 2,000. And 2,000 is for a single individual. If it's a couple, it's actually $3,000. Um, so you can see that they can, it, it kind of excludes uh, the list here of inventory. Maybe the business has a building that it uses, that operating cash, uh, tools, uniforms, anything that's part of the business that they need in order to be doing the business is going to be excluded under property essential to self-support. Now, there is one thing about this that's really important for individuals on SSI to understand is that they have to be a sole proprietor or a simple partnership. Most people want to organize under an LLC or limited liability corporation, but that's going to exclude them from using property essential to self-support. Thank you. And Susie, is there a form or some way that people are supposed to be keeping track of these items that they that, you know, that would count under this so they have that available to Social Security? Well, essentially it would be anything that they uh, have for their business. So um, just the, usually when you're writing the business plan, that's where you're going to put in all those things that you're going to be using. So when they report to the IRS, um, and then they report to Social Security, they're going to say, well, what's this building you own? It's in your name. Well, that's part of my business, you know, that kind of thing. But they don't really have a form or anything that you can fill out. Thank you. Let's take a look at another work incentive, which is called the impairment related work expenses. Can you tell us about those? Yes. So this work incentive does apply to SSI and SSDI. And basically, it's if you think about, is there anything that I usually ask three questions, is there anything that you need in order to work that you're paying for out of your own pocket, and it's related to your disability. So like specially arranged transportation is one of the things that typically um, people will use as an impairment related work expense. So if you're driving like a uh, an adapted vehicle with hand controls or left foot accelerator, something like that, all of your mileage to and from work would be considered impairment related. Um, service animals, there's a whole list over here. 
uh, work-related equipment, maybe the co-payments on drugs or medical services. The thing about when a person is self-employed and is considering using impairment-related work expenses, it's, it's not often that they're going to want to use that because most of those expenses would actually be um, a business expense. And that's more to the advantage of the individual. They can't do both. And Susie, that's an so that's an example where if you can't you can't you could you could have some impairment related work expenses and you could have some um, you know some property essential for self support you could have that both of those things but you can't call one thing both of those so you can't say that your transportation is both of those things or your computer is both of those things you kind of have to decide which category those. That that's going to fall under, is that right? Well, you would want um, you would want it to. It's for impairment related work expenses. So this would be completely separate from the property essential to self support. Basically, it's it's I have this expense, my transportation, because I drive an adapted vehicle. Um, it, I can get my mileage, you know, reimbursed, right? Or it can lower the amount of countable income, or it, it's going to be a business expense because all of your mileage with your business is a business expense. So typically you're going to, it's more inclined to not do impairment related work expenses and, and instead using that as one of your allowable business expenses. Um, because like it, like it says here, you can't do both of those. Um, so I think that's a decision that typically we go through with the individual and decide. Plus, impairment related work expenses, while they're really great, if you're on SSI, you're going to get about half of the value of what the cost is back. So you don't even get total reimbursement. That's why it's better to do it as a, as a business expense. With SSDI, it's even trickier because really an impairment related work expense lowers the amount of countable income. So if the person is below SGA of 1,350 anyway, they're not gonna use an impairment related work expense. And if they're making a really high income, it's possible that the impairment related work expense isn't gonna be big enough to be able to bring them below so that they stay on benefits. So it's one of those things where you periodically have that conversation to see where you're at. And they're all, it always seems to be done in arrears. So, you know, you can usually go back to social security later and say, hey, you know, we're seeing that this should have been applied. And then sometimes that keeps the person on benefits longer. Excellent. That is, those are very great insights. We really appreciate that. Tell us a little bit about trial work periods. I'm sure that a lot of people that are listening in today have heard of this. They have some, um, you know, maybe they've experienced that with someone who is in wage employment. Tell us a little bit about it um, and, and, and remind us a little bit about the NESC we talked about at first and how that's calculated and maybe how this all kind of comes together. Yeah, it, uh, so the, when a person's on SSDI, they they do get a trial work month or nine trial work months and those months are not consecutively triggered they're only going to be triggered if an individual has net earnings from self-employment that are over 970 dollars or if they're contributing 80 hours of month doing doing their business and uh, you know it's good for the person to keep track of that um, because otherwise it kind of gets away from you how many hours you're spending but when they're looking at how do you count the hours you're actually it, you want to actually be doing the business not maybe when you're sitting down and just kind of planning things out it's got to be actually doing those job duties um, and social security is going to at some point toward the end of that trial work they're going to want to do a work activity report and there is a different one for wage employment as opposed to self-employment um, to fill out and what that do is it does is it tries to determine whether or not the individual is using trial work and they're also looking at it and analyzing is this person potentially going to be at uh, sga level wages or not um, that last piece where it talks about it'll last an accumulated nine months within a rolling 60 month period i think that confuses people a lot um, basically what that's saying is if if october is my first uh trial work month that i've used and i don't use all nine of them and that first month uh becomes five years old then it drops off 
And so it's it's a little confusing. It doesn't happen very often for people, um, but some for some disabling conditions that can happen, if, especially if it's something that's pr more progressive, you know, where the individual um, maybe they're functioning pretty well and then all of a sudden things drop off and then they're not able to do their business and then they they haven't used that ninth trial work month so they might get one back but it, it's very it's not very common so Susie let me ask you a couple of questions about the trial work period so if somebody is self-employed and they're just starting their business and they're not really bringing in you know they don't have a lot of sales in those first couple of months and um, or they're starting to see sales pick up, but they've been able to, um, you know, reduce their net earnings because they've had some, you know, some work expenses that, you know, they're calculating. So they're staying under SGA. In that situation, are they using a trial work period month? Yeah, the only way that they're using it is if the, this is the only time with self-employment that Social Security is going to look at it monthly. Okay, so they really need to keep track of it monthly. And what they're looking at is, are the, is their net earnings from self-employment over $970? Um, or are they, you, are they uh, spending 80 hours or more doing the business duties? And so they may or may not be using trial work. And that could go on for a long time because if you think about a lot of businesses, it takes two to three years for an individual to, to really even make any profit at all. And so it's it's important for the individual to be tracking that monthly until they get to that point that that ninth month is used. And then at that point, Social Security is looking again at the SGA level. Okay, they're no longer looking at that lower amount. Very good. Thank you for that explanation. I know that can be kind of challenging to understand because there is a lot more that goes into it for self-employment than there really is for wages because you're wanting to make sure that you have that the net earnings figured out that that you know and includes the reduction based on the business expenses and so that you're you know so you might have one month where there are a lot of sales and you're over SGA but then you might not have there might be several months where you're not you know working at that level and so you're not using those trial work periods I like that you said that it, it's something that because of just the nature of building a business, um, it it could be it could be very typical that it takes a long time to go through those trial work period months, which is a great opportunity for folks to continue receiving their benefit, their cash benefit, while slowly building the business at that pace that they're able to do so. Yeah, typically in Iowa, they'll bring me into every meeting. They'll meet about every month and they'll have me be a part of it so that we can look at the numbers to see where they're at, if they still have their trial work. Um, it just is kind of dependent on where that person is at. It's almost easier once they're past the nine month trial work period, because then they're only going to report once a year. And, and that always makes everything easier. And trial work periods are for SSDI only. Yes. Correct? Yep. Thank you. Let's talk for a minute about unincurred business expenses. Okay, this is a really great work incentive, um, only available under SSDI. And basically what it does is it lowers the countable amount of the individuals, um, what their net earnings are. And basically what you're looking at is, let's say they're working with Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation and we're buying them a computer this month and it's gonna cost $1,000. Well, I uh, that's gonna lower the amount of money that, that Social Security is gonna count because they didn't actually pay for it. It, it isn't, uh, so IRS is not gonna allow them to use that as an allowable deduction because they didn't pay for it, but Social Security is gonna allow them to use that to lower the amount of money that they're gonna count. So it's a great work incentive for people on SSDI. So it doesn't go in their like end of the year reporting for the IRS mm -hmm. because they didn't purchase it. It's not a business expense that came out of their, you know, their, um, investment or their sales or anything like that, but Social Security looks at it as something that can be deducted. Yes. That's a great work incentive. It is. Do we also have a slide for unpaid help? We do. Okay. Tell us a little bit about unpaid help. 
Okay, so unpaid help is another really great one. Let's say that and it is also applied to only SSDI. So let's say that your mother is an accountant and she says, I'm just going to provide your, all your accounting bookkeeping for you and I'm not going to charge you. Well, the value of what she is providing to you, obviously IRS is not going to allow you to deduct it, but Social Security will. So this is another really wonderful work incentive that actually lowers that um, countable income. And I think a lot of times people forget that that's there, um, you know, because it's not, you don't think about that as, oh, well, I, I should be able to claim that. It's a great, it's a great work incentive for people on SSDI. So when figuring out the, the deduction for unpaid help, are, is the business owner looking at what would be the, um, you know, the common cost of that service if they were paying for it and what is equitable in that way? And that's what they're um, taking into consideration? Yeah, typically that's what Social Security is going to ask for, although I, I, I don't know that they always get that far into the weeds, but um, they could request that they provide um, other uh, people who provide that same type of service and what it costs per hour uh, in determining if the person is um, really showing the correct value. So they need, I always tell them they need to be ready to prove you know, that this is actually what it will cost. Very good. So as, us, go, go ahead. ahead, sorry. No, I was I, gonna say, can you tell us a little bit about um, what people may commonly know or refer to as 1619B, it's continued Medicaid eligibility. Okay, so this uh, is applied to only SSI. So remember, SSI is a financially needy program. Individuals that qualify for it, they don't have a work history, typically, or very little, and they have very low income and resources. And so, um, but they really need their Medicaid. That's their health insurance. Every state that you go to is going to administrate their Medicaid health insurance coverage a little bit different. And uh, the way that... Uh, when you look at a continued Medicaid eligibility, there's a there's a myth out there for SSI. Um, people think that if I reduce if I make enough money that my SSI gets reduced to zero because of that work activity, then I'm going to lose everything. I lose my SSI. I lose my Medicaid. All of it goes away, and that's not true. Um, there's actually it it helps to explain that there is also a provision called. Uh, 1619A. And that's what we call the break even point. And basically, that's that dollar amount that when you hit it, your SSI is at zero. But if it goes to zero, because you're working and because of your work income, you get to keep your Medicaid coverage until you exceed your med your state's Medicaid threshold, which this year in Iowa is uh, $46,446 dollars in a year. And so that's a very freeing thing. So as long as a person is in the 1619B status, they're still connected to SSI. They wouldn't have to reapply to get back on SSI. They just would have to, um, you know, make sure that Social Security knows that that they continue to need their SSI. Um, it, it and continue to need their Medicaid. So you I think I was like third in the country of um, states that have you know, third highest amount of individuals that are in this 1619B status, so they don't get any SSI cash benefit, but they still have their Medicaid coverage. And it's just a really great work incentive, especially for people that are self-employed, because, you know, otherwise they'd have to pay for health insurance. And so even if they've stopped, you know, the month they stop getting their SSI, there is no like gap where they're having to go without Medicaid coverage. That just continues without any kind of cessation or reapplication. Yep. As long as they stay under their state's limit for the program. Yeah. And, and you know, we always think that, well, we want to uh, preempt that. I don't want them to lose it. But as long as your state's Medicaid, you know, those, those computers talk at night. You know, Social Security and Iowa Medicaid, they talk at night. And as long as it's still saying that Social Security is saying this person is eligible, 
then the state of Iowa continues to um, keep them on Medicaid. That decision to for them to lose it would have to have come from Social Security. But I know that in Iowa, if they get notice of that, then what they do is send out a letter to the job candidate, and then the job candidate says, "Well, hey, I'm working, um, you know, or these circumstances, or I'm self-employed, whatever it is that they need, they can give evidence of to continue their Medicaid coverage because this is really a critical piece for people. A lot of states have a Medicaid program um, that's called a Medicaid buy-in. In Iowa, we call it Medicaid for Employed Persons with Disabilities. And it allows an individual to have a way higher income. It raises those uh, resource limits from 2,000 to 12,000. And it actually excludes any retirement funds. So a person can actually be, uh, you know, increasing their overall wealth and self-sufficiency um, while still receiving Medicaid. Excellent. Very good. So Dustin, let's just take a moment and talk a little bit about your experience with benefits. When we got together a couple of months back now, we talked about your experience with your education and your, um, you know, your uh, job search and, um, you know, you gave us some tips and things on, um, you know, being a telecommuter and being self-employed and working. And we dabbled a little bit into talking about the various benefits that have kind of, you've had to learn to navigate, um, especially being employed. In light of our discussion today around um, work and benefits, um, I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit and have you share with everyone about your experience. And so just to kind of um, lay the foundation for that, you were receiving SSI, right? Um, your, um, you've been working um, over, kind of over the last couple of years, but increasing your level of work and, um, and that has had an impact on your SSI, correct? Yeah, yeah, so I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm down to the zero amount um, at this point on SSI. You also utilize Medicaid and you um, rely on the home and community-based services waiver that allows you to have help at home, um, you know, other, other types of support for what you need, medical insurance and those kind of things. Um, was that impacted at all when you started working or when your social security went to zero, your SSI went to zero? Yeah, you know, I, I that's it's it's really interesting to hear about this because I I'm I haven't received any notification that I've lost my services um so yeah I, I think I'm still on it I I'm definitely I'm not even close to 47,000 a year or whatever that was so but you're this is making me want to look into that and make sure <laughs> awesome all right it's always good to have an uh um benefits expert in the room. <laughs> and the uh, Ohio uh, threshold would be different than Iowa's. Mm. It would be based on your state's um, overall Medicaid costs. And the other thing that comes into play is if an individual has higher than normal um, Medicaid costs, they can actually request a, a individualized threshold. So um, they could stay on the benefits or keep the Medicaid anyway um, for a pretty long time. Very and make good. a pretty high income. Yeah, thank you. Dustin, when you started working, um, you know, I know in talking with you previously, you had mentioned that your, your goal was always to work enough that you really didn't need to rely on SSI. Like what factored into that for you? Why was that important to you? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I, think I just wanted to be, I, I'd like to be financially independent. Um, you know, I, I did six years of design school, so it was really important to me to use that degree. Um, and, you know, Opportunity for Ohioans with Disabilities um, paid for all my schooling at OSU. Um, so I, I really wanted to use that degree and, and you know, just the learning experience, just trying to, you know, make it on my own and, and see if I can do that um, was important to me. Um, yeah. Now, did you, when, you know, when realizing that you were beginning to work to a level that you were going to lose your cash benefit, did you have any, were you like, okay, here we go, like it's going to happen? Did you have any fears around that or any um, nervousness with that? Yeah, yeah. So 
you know, I, I tried to plan ahead as much as I could. Um, but that, you know, one of the difficulties is like, I don't have a specialist like Susie that I've talked to before really. Um, so, you know, just talking to people on the phone, I heard different stories from different people who probably didn't understand the whole scope of what I was doing. Um, so yeah, I had heard the nine month threshold. I had heard the five year threshold. Um, and now I know a little bit more about that. Um, and I am curious about that. Um, but yeah, so it was, um, it was a little nerve wracking, but, but I, I got the general feeling that, you know, I could get back on social security if needed. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit, it was a little, a little hairy. <laughs> yeah. And I think that like, that just brings up that important point about folks. Um, I, you know, I guess I would say anyone who's receiving benefits, even if they're going to, you know, go work for a company and be wage employed, but really, especially if you're going to be, if you're self-employed, like a subcontractor like yourself, or someone who's starting, you know, a business where they're making, you know, making something, a product or a service that they have the support of a certified um, work incentive coordinator, you know, a benefits counselor that's been trained, that knows the facts, because those, like you said, you, you hear so much, even from professionals sometimes who, who have an impression or they've heard something, or maybe they know a little bit about it um, and they tell it to you and it may not be the full picture. I mean, you know, they may not know that list of like 20 work incentives that might be, you know, some of them will apply to you because they're SSI. Some of them won't apply to you if you're not receiving SSDI. Um, but, you know, that level of expertise and that kind of support is so, so, so important. Um, would you have advice to other people who are setting out on their own self-employment journey related to understanding social security, preparing to go to zero on the cash benefit or learning about work incentives? What kind of guidance would you give to folks based on your experience? Yeah, yeah, I would say, um... You know, I am not a super uh, administrative, organized person. Uh, so I did my best to like understand the money amounts um, and to understand like when I would lose my benefits. Um, and as much of that as you can do as possible is, is great. Um, planning ahead, understanding like, you know, how things could go. Um, I think definitely like, so for me, full transparency, um, self-employment's a little bit of a struggle. Um, just working remote and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about um, looking for more of a steady job um, and less of a freelance position. Um, so, you know, just, just be open because you don't really know how things are gonna go, especially with disability. Um, I'm still figuring out what I can do and what my limits are. Um, so yeah, just be just, it's a lot though. It is a lot. There's because yeah, it, it's every time you make a big change like that, it's going to affect your benefits in, in the process of all that. Um, so yeah, just be ready to know your options. Um, and again, like, like you're saying, I think if you can get an expert to help you with that, that's really going to be helpful. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I appreciate that you, you know, share about some of the challenges and like knowing yourself and your own capacities. Um, that I think that's one of the cool things about the work incentives. And Susie alluded to this a little earlier as well, is that, you know, Social Security wants people to, you know, I mean, ultimately to be self-sufficient and to get off benefits, if that is at all possible, but they have built in the, these um, supports so that you can try, right? And you can, you can stretch your capacity, you can move at your own pace, you can get to the point where you're like, I can do this and maybe I can do more. Or you can get to the point where you say, I can do more and then you have to pull back a little bit and say, I'm learning about myself through this process and really what my capacities are. And it may, you know, it may not be sustainable to do 
something at this level. And those work incentives are there to support you through that. So it's excellent to kind of think about your journey through this, of you know, discovering yourself as a self-employed person um, and what all of that that means and, you know, what kind of benefits that there might be available to you. Susie, can you tell us a little bit about some of those safety nets? So for somebody that's self-employed, and this is true for, about, for people who are wage employed, who maybe, you know, they've, they've gone, they've moved forward, they've been working at a level where they um, have been able to achieve the NESE above SGA, and then they find that they really need to kind of pull that back a little bit, that it, you know, their own capacities, um, you know, they have to kind of rein that in a little bit. What kind of options are there once somebody's lost that benefit, but then realize that they may need it again? Yeah, the expedited reinstatement is an additional safety net that um, really hasn't been around as long as some of the other ones. It kind of was advocated for by people with disabilities because there needed to be an easy way back on benefits. Um, and so that's why this one came about. And it basically it provides a five year window of time. Let's say the individual has been working in, in self-employment. Um, they're well over SGA. They've gone through all of the other work incentives and um, now their benefit is uh, technically, according to Social Security, considered to be terminated. Um, at that point, even though it's terminated, it starts a five-year clock. And during that five-year period of time, an individual, if their disability makes it again so that they're not able to work and earn at that SGA level wages, they call Social Security and Social Security is going to restart their benefits. That's why it's expedited. Um, they're going to receive that cash benefit. Um, for up to six months. They'll restart their Medicare if that's ended. And during that six month period of time, they're actually going to do a medical review to see if it's related to that original disabling condition. And if it is, then they just continue to get their benefits. Um, it's an excellent work incentive. It does apply to both SSI and SSDI. But with SSI, it, I, I honestly have never ever seen it um, because, an indiv because of that threshold, that high income threshold with SSI, um, typically you're not going to see that because the individual is still going to be connected to SSI. But with SSDI, it happens often and it's usually with disabilities that are more cyclical in nature. So like uh, maybe somebody has cancer. Um, and then they get to a period of recovery and maybe cancer reoccurs or somebody who has MS, um, they go along for a period of time where they're at a level functioning and then functioning drops and they're no longer able to work for a period of time. Also, you see this a lot with any kind of mental health disability um, and sometimes with brain injury, but it, it, it really is an excellent work incentive. So once they've received those six months and let's say Social Security comes back and says, no, this is not related to that original disabling condition, um, then they're going to stop the benefits, but they do not make the person pay that money back. So that's also kind of a cool work, work incentive that's there. Excellent. And then there's another one that we wanted to ask you about, and that's called extended period of eligibility. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so this all only applies to SSDI, and this is a period of time. So we talked about the trial work period. Um, the nine month trial work period is only for SSDI. And once they've used that ninth trial work period, that month, the next month, that 10th month, starts this new period of time called the extended period of eligibility. So that period of time is gonna last 36 months. It's different from trial work because those 36 months are going to click off whether the person's working or not. So they just zoom through those three years. But if at any time during those three years, for any reason, they're below SGA level wages, they just call Social Security and let them know and they restart their benefits. They don't have to reapply. During that three year period of time, you see people, you know, on and off again. And it can get really confusing. And so we want people to really pay attention to that because when I see these really big overpayments, this is the period of time when those happen um, because 
their social security hasn't stopped their benefits yet they're in this 36 month they're still getting their cash benefit maybe they've had a benefit planner like me that said hey november's your last month that you should be getting it um but they they still get it the next month and they think well you know social security i don't understand them if they're sending me the cash benefit it's getting deposited then probably i'm supposed to keep it right and oftentimes that's not right. And so we really want to make sure that people are uh, paying attention to that. And if they still get a check after that, they, they contact Social Security to say, hey, you know what? I didn't think I was supposed to get it this month, but I got it anyway. And then, you know, because then Social Security can look in their records and make sure. It, it's just really important to stay up on, on that. Susie, I don't have a... I don't have a slide for this, but I it raised a, a, a question has come up about, um, you know, we talked about some of these work incentives that are for people who receive SSI, and there are some of these work incentives for people who receive SSDI, and there are some that apply to both. And yes. early on, you mentioned that, um, you know, SSI is, well, SSI and SSDI have the same disability related requirements to qualify. They have differences in income um, that allows someone to qualify. SSI being more of like you mentioned, it's like a um, an entitlement or a welfare type program. You have to have, you have to be at a certain, almost at the poverty, about the poverty level. Um, you can't have resources, income and resources over a certain amount. And then SSDI, you have earned your way into that, right? Um, by paying into the system, by earning enough money over time. Now, while this isn't a specific social security work incentive, someone who is on SSI, who starts a, their own self-employment venture and begins making money over SGA and begins um, no longer receiving that cash benefit, they are also then, we looked at NESE, they're paying into that system now, right? Can you tell us, what impact that has on their ability to ultimately qualify for SSDI, which down the road has, it seems to be a lot more work incentives um, and a lot more opportunity to kind of have some of those safety nets in place. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, it's actually uh, pretty cool the way that works. And, and it, uh, you know, cause typically you gotta have, uh, 10 years or 40 quarters of um, high enough wages, maybe I said that wrong, um, but you have you have a long period of time where you have to have worked and paid paid in enough social security, you know, your earnings were high enough that you qualify. Um, that can take a, a lifetime, but um, individuals that are under age 30, um, they incrementally, they have less quarters of earnings they have to have in order to qualify for SSDI. So somebody under 24 is only going to need six uh, qualifying quarters. So this year qualifying quarter would be a month where they have net earnings from self-employment over $1,510 in those three months. Um, so you can see, you know, when our, when our students start to work when they're 16 or 18, it's only a year and a half and they could start qualifying for an SSDI benefit. Um, now it gets tricky because if they're at over SGA level wages, they wouldn't actually qualify for SSDI. Um, but sometimes there's times where they would go below. Now, I, I think I told you that last week we had the um, APSI conference and we had five different um, self-employed individuals, all uh, younger. And one of them that, that uh, started his business about a year and a half ago, um, he, he welds um, junk metal and makes art. It's amazing. Um, they he's not at a level where he's over SGA and Social Security has reviewed his income and said, hey, you know, now you're going to qualify for SDI. And so that was one of the things that I talked to them about last week was, you know, um, reworking that and understanding because now they're on both. He's going to be on both benefits, SSI and SSDI. And, you know, the work incentives for the most part are completely different, but there is a point in time where a person could switch over to SSDI. It's never really super simple, um, but it's something that, you know, I try to be aware of when I see that that person is earning enough money that they could eventually qualify for both benefits. And Susie, typically is that something that someone has to be monitoring for themselves or does social security 
take note of someone who has now like a, you know, they do a query and they find that they have had these earnings and they, they determine that qualification. Yeah, Social Security may pick up on it if the person is, um, you know, regularly reporting their wages. Uh, it just kind of depends. Um, it doesn't seem like it's something that we can actually make happen, although in some cases, if they're under SGA, like this family, I just told them, I said, I think he might qualify for SSDI. Why don't you do an application online? And that's kind of what started that ball rolling. Excellent. Thank you for that. Another, while it's not necessarily uh, falling under the Social Security work incentives, it is a, it is a, a you know, a consideration for somebody yeah. who is on SSDI, like Dustin, uh, for example, being on SSDI and working and paying now, paying into the system, and if there does ever come a, you know, a time when you're not able to work at that SGA level, you know, there, there may be some considerations um, that you've earned enough to then qualify for SSDI if that, you know, if, you know, if that is uh, something you might need in the future. And again, another reason to have a um, certified work incentive coordinator on your team that is really following those things and making sure that um, you're, you have eligibility for everything that you should. There are a couple of different um, resources that we want to share with you as we wrap things up today. Um, Su Susie has created some amazing um, guides and templates that are, um, they, they allow you to do some of these complicated things in a very easy and efficient manner. And so I'm going to try to pull those up just to show them to you and let Susie walk you through them. So give me just a moment to do that. And hopefully you all can see that now, the SSI Countable Net Earnings from Self-Employment Tracking Sheet. Is that available to you? Can you all see that? Yep. So Susie, just tell us what this is briefly and how this could be useful to someone, even somebody who's not a benefits expert um, and what they could do with something like this. I uh, What I do is I create an individualized one for each person, depending on what benefit they're on. So this this one is very the very simple, just on SSI. And so all the individual has to do is enter their sales and their expenses, and it does all that calculation for them. In fact, I actually lock down all of the um, cells that they so they can't mess up the formulas. Um, I don't put a password in, so if they send this out, you'll be able to adjust it if you need to. Um, but it's really, it's really helpful because it kind of helps them see how they're trending throughout the year. Um, and that way, if they get partway through the year and it looks like their SSI should be getting reduced for the whole year, they can alert Social Security that they go ahead and start estimating their wages a little bit so that um, they're not super overpaid. But you know, with SSI, it's almost impossible to not be overpaid and then underpaid and overpaid. It, it just, it, it's part of the nature of the benefit. Um, but the thing that I always remind people is it's, it, Social Security never charges interest. If you're overpaid, um, the most they can take out of your SSI check is $84.10. So oftentimes if that first year and they're not really sure, I say, well, you just kind of let it ride. And if you get overpaid at the end of the year, you know, you can pay for it out of your proceeds from your business um, because they're not going to charge you interest. It's kind of like you got a no interest loan for the whole year um, because people are really afraid of, you know, being overpaid and getting kicked off for that. So yeah, so that's the SSI tracking chart. And I add a lot of things to it because I people, a lot of individuals that I serve will also have a wage job. The, the young man that I told you about that's welding um, junk metal, he also works at the country club. And so he has those wages and they're a part of his um, calculation too. And now we're going to add the SSDI piece of it because that's unearned income. And he has a plan to achieve self-support or pass, which allows him to set aside all of his countable income and then use that money to further his employment goal. It's a it's an excellent work incentives. And so, um, you know, that's another thing, component that I add to it for the individual. And we did not talk about past today. So Susie, we will have to have you back again and do <laughs> an entire session just on past. And maybe we can have Dustin yeah. back 
and we will maybe we can use you as a case study and write a pass plan for you, Dustin. That but would be fun. That would be fun. Be um, Susie, I've also pulled up the SSDI Excel um, sheet tracking sheet. I hopefully that is showing up now too for you. Um, did it switch over to that? Not yet. Um, It should be showing up now. It looks similar to the SSI sheet, but you can see that it has some of those other work incentives built in. Tell us about this, Susie. Yeah, so uh, the same premise in the sense that you're going to enter your services and your expenses, and then it's going to do the calculation for you. So that Nessie, it determines that net earnings from self-employment. But you see below where it says Nessie, it's going to say unpaid help, unincurred business expenses, impairment related work expenses. So those uh, cells is where the individual would enter, okay, Voc Rehab paid for this computer, it was $1,000, you would put it in that month. Um, unpaid help would be mom doing the accounting. And so then that's going to lower that countable amount um, that Social Security is going to look at. The other thing with SSDI is because you get a trial work month, you have to, or trial work period, you actually have those nine months, um, but they don't get triggered unless the person's over $970. So this actually helps them be able to track and see where they're at on a monthly basis. So if you scroll down just a little bit, okay, go up just a tad, if it lets you. It will, I just have to move my Zoom pictures. Okay, so you see where it says gross income wage employment? That's where um, a lot of my people do have other jobs, but then these uh, nine trial work months. So the SSDI, it really has three phases that an individual goes through. It's They have a nine month trial work period. You can make as much as you want, no effect on your benefit. Then you have a three year period of time. That period of time, you can write back on benefits as long as you're below SGA um, without having to reapply. And then you have that 60 month clock that starts if you've gone off benefits, that expedited reinstatement. So what this does, it, it actually calculates, it pulls down what you've calculated above. And if if you were earning over 970 um, in that square where it says uh, column B, row 25, it'll actually turn red if you're over SGA uh, or if you're over that 970. Or in line 26, it'll turn red if you're over SGA. I, I had never knew how to do that before. And I think it's so cool. So green That's to go good. or red to stop, right? Or red right. to just indicate that you've used a trial work month, I think is what it is. And then if you go over to the right more, it's just a little bit. Just a moment and I will move it to the right. Yeah, you see where it says for SSA? Now that's at the end of the year. So throughout the year, it's tracking to tell somebody if they're trending higher than SGA or lower. And so what our job candidates can do then is, let's say they have a really super good year, half, half of the year is gone and they're, it's trending over SGA. They wanna tell Social Security and they've used all the trial work. They wanna tell Social Security, stop sending me my cash benefit. Because with SSDI, it's all or nothing. You either get the whole benefit or not at all. And those amounts are way higher, usually averaging around $1,200 a month, but that can lead to a pretty big overpayment. And so this kind of helps people be able to track it. And tracking those overpayments for SSDI, there are, there are higher consequences there mm -hmm. than the SSI where you know they could build in a repayment at $84 a month or something. The SSDI gets a little more can be a little bit more hefty and is that true yeah they can actually take the whole that whole month cash benefit typically you can talk them out of that um but yeah it's really it, it's really important for people to be able to um to be able to see where they're trending so and so susie along with these two excel documents you've created kind of like a guide that explains some of these things that we've talked about today breaks it down for there's, there's a guide for SSI and then there's a guide for SSDI um, that somebody could have as a resource um, to look at. These are just like, I think they're just one pagers. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That goes into some of the key work incentives and explains how they work. 
Yeah, and a little bit on the um, on their health insurance that they qualify for. I, I like to be able to see a picture. I think most people do it. I can read the words, but then to be able to actually see it makes import it, it makes it um, real for people. So I start out with the difference between wage and self employment. Um, with social with SSI and then I go into the picture and the example and if you and then the property essential to self support because that's the main thing for um, when you're self employed and you're on SSI and then the health insurance of course and if you click on that SSDI one it, it's going to look quite a bit different um, because it goes through those three phases that I told you about um, and it kind of explains how those are going to be triggered, but then it also looks at your Medicare and then those additional work incentives that you can use unpaid help and unincurred business expenses. So it just gives people that one page snapshot and then some links to some other resources like Iowa's Medicaid for employed persons with disabilities. You know, sometimes I put Social Security links in there if, um, you know, individual wants to see what does social security say oh yeah and you've got um the red book the red book is excellent it's very very brief it doesn't go into a huge amount of details but sometimes that's all they need um there's great resources um with this with what you guys are doing in griffin and hamas um and then vcu um you know because that's that's where i go for my technical assistance is vcu and really most of the self-employment that I learned was through doing it with people, but it was with the center on, you know, the individuals that work for the center on uh, self-employment, Griffin and Hamas, um, because they came to Iowa and they spent lots and lots of time going to every small town and providing these self-employment seminars to um, individuals that wanted to start their own business that were on, dis you know, that were on a disability benefit. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susie. The resources that Susie has created and shared with us, we're going to um, try to have those uploaded as a resources on the center on selfemployment.org website so that you can, you can use those. Susie has been very gracious and generous with us to make sure that you all have access to those. She's created those so that the, you know, they're like, like she was showing us, you know, the hard, the hard part is already done. <laughs> like she's colored them so they turn in, they turn red, right? Oh, the, the part that, you know, the self-employed person and their supports is just about entering the numbers um, and keeping track of the numbers. And so um, using those tools might be very helpful for you. We wanna make sure that you have access to those. Susie and Dustin, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today, for talking about the big wide world of work incentives. Susie, we so value your expertise. Um, in this and um, everything that you've shared for us today. Dustin, thank you so much for just sharing a little bit about your considerations, the things that you've thought about, the things that you continue to think about as your employment journey uh, moves forward and evolves. Um, and just, you know, your insight into that is really helpful. I think people appreciate hearing from you and your own um, experience, you know, um, going through all of this and what you've learned about. So we do appreciate both of you today. Thank you to all of you who have joined us today. And um, we hope that you've learned a lot about work incentives and you could take advantage of some of these resources. Thanks so much.